you know, I, I don't know. Right, you probably, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, this is, a, this, this is a, a leaflet here which says, why have you come to Murmansk, right? And um, I noticed on the bottom here, there's a mate of ours from Bristol, well, because you've found it, it comes from South Wales, interestingly. But there's a bloke here called Lenin, I think his name is. I think he's Lenin, yeah. So Lenin wrote a letter to, um, to British soldiers who were in, in uh, part of the Allied intervention in Russia in 1918 and 1919. It's a great leaf there. It's on the Radical History site, on the History Group site, and it's worth reading because it's kind of saying, what are you doing here? You know, what are you all doing here? And it's a good, it's a good political analysis, which I'm sure, like, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of British soldiers read in Momansk and Archangel in 1919 and 1919. So, um, and it really does have a part to play in this talk, which I'll come on to. Now, what I'm going to try and do with this talk, if you click the next slide, please. No, no, no. Oh, sorry, Matt. It's all right, I'll do that. That's right, Matt. Um, what I'm trying to do with this talk is I'm just going to do, this is a work in progress. That's the most important point to get out of this talk, right? The research work that's been going on recently amongst some of us in around radical history groups is beginning, really, if anything, is a work in progress. So this talk is not finished. It's just some research I did earlier this year with a couple of other people helping to try and pull together some information about British strikes and mutinies in this period of 1989, which was the peak of it in, on the mainland, also in France, for the British Army, Navy and Air Force. So it's an ongoing project, and that's what the second little bit at the end of me, the last 20 minutes we'll try, if I get through it quickly, we'll try and talk about some ideas and questions that have been brought up by these 100th anniversary celebrations. So if you want to... Oh, I don't want to... Right, this is just a little quote here. Uh, British Armed Forces strikes me as, but this is a quote from Metropolitan Police Assistant Commissioner in charge of Special Branch <laughs> during the First World War. He said in 1922, he said, during the first three months of 1919, unrest touched, this is Special Branch, the head of Special Branch, right, the secret, the British secret police. During the first few months of 1919, unrest touched the high water mark. I do not think at any time in history since the Bristol riots. I, I love this, it's killed two birds with one stone, this one. Because I was told that was a load of drunken debauchery, it had no political meaning whatsoever. And then the special branch thinks it was nearly a revolution. So, yeah, result for Bristol, and result for 1919 and those soldiers who went on strike. So, you've never been so near revolution, that's what he thought. So, um, that's where that quote jumped out at me when I first started doing the work here the last year. So, anyway. There you go, Bristol breaks it. So the plan is quick introduction, put some context about what we been going on in the First World War. I'm going to talk a bit slightly more in detail about some of the mutinies I've been looking at, but I've been trying to do a much, to start with a much broader analysis, not going down into individual mutinies and researching them. Because what we really need to do, especially with large social movements or movements such as this, is to try and gather as much statistical evidence to begin with so that people can go off and do their local research. It doesn't work the other way around, in my opinion. So what, we're trying, what I'm saying is, is that you can start with oh, research in evenings in Bristol, but if you want to get a picture of this movement, right, then you have to, like, first of all, try and at least get some ideas about where that stuff was happening in the country. So less detail but more spread is the plan, and that's what I've been doing. So other people go off and do their research in Huddersfield or wherever, or Bath or something. So um, that's what we're doing. So there's a bit of stats, talk about the main incidents, and a little bit about what the form and content of these disturbances were amongst the army in particular, also the sailors and the air force. And then a bit about Bristol, so you know, because I've looked at Bristol, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on next year, will be the research to Bristol, and, and stuff about Russia, and then very quickly about the Radical History Project. So um, that's what I do, let's get on with that. Right, so you all know about these world, everyone know about these World War anniversaries, plans that Cameron's coming up with, I'm sure most of you know, heard about them. I saw it, I was kind of, yeah, yeah I got sort of nauseous when I saw it, because I thought, well, that's to be interesting. But anyway, he's making a bit of a fuss about the Christmas truce of September, of December 1948. He's been making a bit of a fuss about, you know, where everyone goes out and plays football, and, you know, we can kind of celebrate. That was brought up in the media a few months, a couple of months ago. Um, but the question is, are they going to be, you know, they're more than likely going to be sanitised, apolitical and nationalist. And if you, for example, went out and said, well, we need to celebrate mutiny, it'd probably be the same as trying to celebrate a major politician's death or something. So um, it's not going to be popular necessarily. But the plan is, is to try and disrupt these, these, this idea of the World War, World War I, which it happened in the 60s actually. It's the first stage, I would argue, where the world, where culturally the war was turned upside down a little bit. But, um, by uh, Oh What a Lovely War, if you've ever seen that. I mean, that kind of period, there was a bit of, you know, attempt to relook at it. 
there's other questions about how long it takes to deconstruct wars. I, I generally fear around 50 years in this country, British, British, in British state, 50 years to really get to grips with trying to criticise a war. So, the Second World War will be coming up fairly soon. <laughs> you have to wait to people are dead in this country before you start saying, was that worth it? Right, so uh, just a quick misconception to pop the myths I've been looking at and other people have talked about in the last few months. Uh, the idea of British Army universal discipline and loyalism. Right? It's this idea that everybody else needs these, but the British, uh, uh, we're the most professional, best army in the world, uh, nonsense. Um, the 1914 Christmas truce, I call that a distorted popular memory because we know about it, really. so it's not hidden. We know about it. We know about it because they couldn't hide it, it was so massive. Most people, I thought it was a couple of hundred people playing football, you know, across no man's land. It was 100,000 troops involved. And it happened in 1914, at Easter, in November 1915, and also again in Christmas 1915 as well. And then they tried to do it in 1916, but they were threatened with guns by the Red Officers. It's true. So, so 1914 Christmas troops definitely needs to be opened up. Like, on a mass scale, was out of this like little myth of silent night and a few people kicking the ball about, to be a major period of fraternisation between, you know, between Allied and German troops. Right, Russian Revolution spread of the Soviet. This is a really important one. Why did the idea of the Soviet appear in Seattle to St. Petersburg to Southampton to Clydeside to Barcelona? You know, you, you go around the world and the Soviet starts appearing. Soviet being something, uh, a workers' council, effectively, or a community council created in the 1905 Russian Revolution. That's where the word Soviet comes from. It was created by the work class in the 1905 Revolution. So this went all around the world. People started setting soldiers and saying as councils up. How did that happen? Right, uh, revolution, mutiny, and strikes in the end of the First World War One. I. I mean, I, in my opinion, the biggest bit of failure of British historians in the post war period is to show how those things ended the First World War. Because the myth, there's a myth at the end of the First World War, oh, it was a British victory. Well, actually, the French didn't fight. There's a reason for that. But, so that's a question that needs to be looked at. Um, and then also the, the effect on the Allied war of intervention, you know, to try and crush the Bolshevik Revolution, or the Russian Revolution, and the Bolsheviks in Russia. At the end of the war, again, that's its collapse. And, it, and people, most people don't even know we invaded Russia, so that's it. And lastly, you know, it was Britain and Europe in 1990 the closest ever to world revolution. That's, arguably true. So that's it. Um, they're the kind of questions, we, some of the questions we're talking about at the moment, trying to think about how to frame them over the next five years, because it's going to go up to 2019. So right, yeah, a bit of context. So what's going on before 1980, 1990? You'll see this, uh, the armistice in, in, in August 1918, which is a truce, not a defeat. True. So what happens, obviously, you know, you've got this 1917 February-October revolution in Russia, Russian army collapses, returns to like St. Petersburg, Moscow and the other major centres, brings down Tsarism, and then, um, and then the, uh, the, the new liberal bourgeois government decides to send the Russians back to war. Things to stay near the main. That's why you get the Bolshevik revolution of October 1917, in my opinion. Because the new bourgeois government comes in, the constituent assembly, and tries to send the Russian working class back to fight again against the Germans. Of course, everyone goes, well, we didn't just have a revolution to get rid of the Tsar, we just wanted to stop the war. So that causes a, that revolution. That revolution causes the Russian army effectively to collapse. They eventually sign a, a treaty with, with Germany in 1918, with the Brest Treaty, where they basically sign a peace. So that's all this stuff is going on through this period. I'm not even going to talk about the massive effect that the Russian Revolution had across the world. Um, also in 1917, there's the French Spring Mutinies. Now this line, the French Spring Mutinies, doesn't really do it justice, because um, there are 120 divisions of the French army on the Western Front. 68 of them. 68 divisions mutinied <coughs> in the spring of 1917. And many of them marched on Paris to try and overthrow the government. But anyway, I didn't know about that much. So that kind of is a huge event in 1917 that we don't really, we in Britain don't know much about, except the French are cowards or something. <laughs> so you know, that's about the level we're at in this kind of stuff. So, so um, like the Italians, you know. Like, anyway, so um, the French Spring Mutiny is very, very important. Effectively, the French army cannot launch an offensive after the spring of 1917. So for a year, it's completely out of action. They hold, they hold the lines. They were close to trouble, serious revolutionary problems in France in 1917. Anyway. The British, so what are the British up to in 1970? Well, they are mutinying. There's plenty of mutiny, there's plenty of refusals going on at a day-to-day level in the trenches, but all over, 
all over the front, but famously a tar pause is very important. You may have heard this word. Everyone seen the monocle mutiny in the 80s? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, a tar pause is central to that story. And why a tar pause is important is because it's this huge base for the transmission of troops that are coming from Britain and the Commonwealth to the front line in, um, you know, in the Western Front, the military in the trenches. These are huge sort of marshalling bases where they bring tens of thousands of troops passing through them all the time as they're coming in and then going to the front. And those bases, they're kind of training them for frontline combat. Um, these bases become centres of mutiny, strikes, and almost insurrection in the latter part of the war. There's a huge mutiny in the Tarpons in 1917, involving 10,000 troops. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about that, because that's another story, but it's part of the context of what happens in 1918 and So there's significant problems in the British Army. The French Army won't fight. Um, now we come on to the you know, German, the German mutinies. And I'm not even talking about general descent and the smaller mutinies that are going on all of these armed forces throughout the whole period of the First World War. It's talking about the major incidents. So, in, in October 1918, you get the famous Wilhelm Saab and Kiel German fleet mutinies, right? They're trying to send them out to sea for some futile battle against the British. They mutiny. And this kicks off the German Revolution of 1918 and Again, a huge amount of stuff around that I'm not going to talk about. And eventually you end up with the November 1918 armistice. And the British strikes and mutinies really get off the ground after that. And you could argue for one simple reason. People have had enough. <laughs> they don't want to fight them. No one wants to fight anymore. No one wants to fight the <coughs> army. Everyone wants out. They've had enough, right? So the British strikes and should be seen in that context. They're not strictly what they were totally what they're about. That's the primary thing, demobilization. Similarly, you also get after this period, which I'm just about to talk about, these happen in mainly in mainland UK and also in, um, and in France and Belgium so in that period of December, which is what I'm going to talk about. And after that, there's mutinies in Russia, the British forces mutiny in Russia, uh, there's significant mutinies, the Marines, British Royal Marines mutiny, all sorts of stuff happens, and then the French Black Sea Fleet mutinies in 1918, uh, sorry, not April 1919. So these are kind of major events of the collapse of Allied and German forces between 1917 and 1919. And my argument is, if you put all that together along with all the other stuff we don't know, you're probably seeing why the First World War ended. Anyway, it's debatable. Right, British strikes and mutinies. Right, we'll quickly go through some stats. This is work I've been doing with some couple of other people. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of it. So in, in this period, November 1918 to February 1919, in Britain, there were about, I found about 70 uh, strikes and mutinies. I'll come on to the difference in a minute, but strikes and mutinies in that period of a couple of months involving at least 75,000 British personnel. Right? In France there were about 30, so these are the ones we know about. This is the early part of the research, there's a lot more yet. 32 of them, there were 32 in a similar period in France involving 25,000 British, the Commonwealth troops. And this is a much better estimate from what I've seen. About a quarter of a million British and Commonwealth personnel were involved in strikes and mutinies in this period. To give you an idea, a quarter of a million, uh, there were about five million British people under arms in the First World War, at the end of the First World War. <coughs> so it's a significant number of troops, a quarter of a million. Um, so the question you ask yourself is not, you know, the details of this, but why don't we know about it? That's the first question. Why don't we know about this? And obviously there is bits and pieces culturally and there's bits of history here and there, but anyway, it's there and it's massive. Um, <coughs> right, why weren't they shot? Why didn't they mute, do all these people for mutiny? Because then um, the British Army uh, condemned 3,000 people for mutiny in the First World War, but most of them were during the war. When this happens towards the end of the war, they don't seem to apply mutiny to all these tens of thousands of troops that are going AWOL, rioting, marching on Parliament, you know, putting fixed bayonets in Whitehall or whatever. They don't do anything. The reason is they're frightened. They're not going to apply mutiny in Britain because it's going to cause more trouble than it's worth. In fact, they don't even come down very hard on the strikers and mutineers and the British Army, at RAF and Navy in Britain. They do in France, though. They're a bit more tough in France, but that's because it's not visible to the British public. So here's a little graph, a bit of stats, which is quite good, just to give you an idea what's going on. So it starts on the 2nd of January 1919. Okay, and the red line is what's happening in Britain. And these are incidents per day. So, say on the 6th of January or 7th of January, there was about 13 strikes and mutinies in different places in the country. 
What's interesting about it is in France, you can see it bobbling along all the time. The stuff, there's trouble in France going on all the way through, right back until 1918. But then there's suddenly a peak at the end of the month in France. You can see that, which is um, a lot to do with the amount of auxiliary uh, personnel that the army is using, like Army Service Corps, all the people do logistics, run the ports, organise the distribution centres, do, you know, moving supplies, the whole logistic effort involves you know, probably a million people, or hundreds of thousands of people. So in France, this is a lot to do with that period, is to do with a lot of those Army Service Corps going on strike. In Britain, there's a huge wave here, which has a huge political impact. We'll come on to it in a minute. Right, so next one. Right, so what, these are just some of the main events in Britain. I'm not really going to talk a lot about France, but I'll talk about Britain really. But it really starts, it's quite funny, it starts on January the 3rd, 4th of 1919. And um, it starts in Folkestone, this sort of wave of disturbances and mutinies and strikes. So 10,000 Army Service Corps, uh, Royal Engineers and Artillery sort of basically went on strike and started to picket all the ships, uh, stopping troops going to France. So Folkestone's port is actually shut down by soldiers and some sailors. Uh, and basically what they're saying is, is that the demand is, we want demobilisation now, the war is over, right? and we're not going to let anybody go to France either. But famously, on the same day, um, in London, they were doing a, uh, a big parade, you know, sort of the household, the Cold Street Guards, the Queen, they're all down, you know, seeing all these being marching, and they were all sending off to France to go and fight cover the, the armistice, so all these sort of famous royal regiments and they all, this massive parade, they threw all their flowers and they all left from, uh, from Whitehall or whatever and down the Mall and then they had to come back because the shop port was shut down. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get to France because the soldiers and so, anyway. So it had an impact straight away, like, you know, like that's a, they all came marching back. But anyway, um, so then you, at the same day, a flotilla of minesweepers in the side of Scotland refused to sail, right? Um, and they did it on the basis that they, they were saying, we want to be demobilised, we're, we're, we're trawlermen. <laughs> we want to go and get fish, we don't want to be buggering about this anymore. So they, they go on strike, and they basically strike <laughs> the sails, which is where the word comes from. Yeah. And then, uh, and finally, uh, the, the dispute, the trouble in folks spreads to Dover, where 4,000 British, Australian and Canadian soldiers march and demonstrate. So this is the first moment where it hits. Now, interestingly, they didn't suppress it very quickly, this. This is over a couple of days, and it gets out of the press a little bit. Right? And then they start to suppress it, the, you know, the D notices, the military, and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, it spreads. Um, January 5th to 8th, through 20 plus army and RF bases, basically people refuse. I'll come on to the kind of concept these things about. They refuse to do things, they uh, march and demonstrate. Uh, and many people marched over that period down, soldiers marched from the war office and onto Westminster, famously frightening the hell out of like, the war office because they were suddenly faced with hundreds of soldiers with fixed bayonets outside going, we want, we want out. So um, it didn't go down very well. And then finally there was this other phase from January 9th to 20th where it kind of spread across the country, you know, literally Scotland, Belfast, all sorts of stuff. Um, and all, there were all sorts of incidents, I can't go into the details more, but there are loads, lots of things. It shows some similarities. But most interestingly, the one that's again suppressed, we might not find out about it until 2019 because of the 100 year rule. 20,000 soldiers took over Southampton, a Soviet was formed actually, and they raised a red flag and everything. And um, they, shut, they tend to shut the port down and declare a Soviet, they pull their soldiers and say this committee raised the red flag. Um, the strike was actually repressed this one. The military authorities didn't really repress these other ones um, because they were scared really. But in Southampton, a very small firm, um, I can't remember his name, but a friend of Churchill's from a very small part called General Way in there smashed it basically, but um, they also suppressed any news about it. So we don't even know when the Southampton strike happened, but it was over two days and involved 20,000 soldiers. Huge event. So that's a sort of example of one that's hidden but massive. So um, anyway, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. And the typical form of content, this is typical, so it's not, you know, exclu exclusive. It's like, this is mostly what sort of things would happen. First of all, you get these sort of meetings in canteens or in the mess halls or wherever or wherever the base was, you know, people would be start talking, this would be going for some time. We don't know the undercurrent <coughs> of political, we don't know enough about the undercurrent of political and other forms of dissent in the army yet. 
you know, we've got some ideas, but this would be done at some time, so there is a context to this. And then basically people started to come together and say, right, we want out, we want out. We don't want to do this war anymore. We're not going to Russia, because they're, they're telling everybody, oh, you know, there's only volunteers going to Russia. People are scared they're going to get on the ship and end up in the mans, you know what I mean? So people want out. And so they start talking, meetings form. It happens in all, their, all branches of the, of the armed forces, you know, armed forces, maybe an air force army. And, um, and these sort of councils are technically nascent Soviets, really, a similar form to what you would see in the Russian army in 1917. So uh, then what happens is, once people have sort of met, and sometimes these are reversed, there might be an incident, and then a meeting which forms the soldiers and sailors council, or alternatively there might be a council which then leads to a strike. So they're kind of interchangeable, these first few things. Generally people refuse to pray, drill, train, and get on ships or work. So the whole thing stops, and those kind of things yeah, these are kind of refusals that people did. There are other things as well. They would often storm into guard houses and release people who had been seized by the military police. They'd fight the military police. Sometimes they broke into riots. You know, I'm not, no disrespect to any Aussies or Canadians here, but they're the best at rioting, definitely. They, they don't much about it. They burn the places down straight away. They, they were very, very disrespectful of their military bases. They've been stuck in for a year in the freezing cold in God knows what. Like, East Anglia or somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they don't muck about, but a lot of this was much more sort of organised in the sense of it, it, it being a negotiating relationship. Um, often the officers would try and stop it and they'd be given this rough music, given loads of jet, jostled, sometimes they would be <laughs> arrested by the soldiers. Um, so lots of stuff went on like that, and then basically the whole base would go AWOL. They would sort of send out delegates out to other bases nearby or other parts of the camp, and they everybody would march off and go to the nearest HQ, Town Hall, or even to Whitehall, and they'd steal all the lorries, jump in the lorries, drive to London, go and confront the war office. We want out. Right? That's the demands, really. So um, they would make their demands for their councils to the local to military and government officials, there'd be some kind of negotiation. These two demands are the most common out now, demobilization, and we're not going to Russia. And um, lots and lots of bad conditions, which were pretty awful for a lot of troops. You know, even at that stage of the war, it was pretty awful. Not on the front line, I'm talking about sitting in East Anglia in a freezing tent for six months with very little food because you're waiting to be deemed, you know, sent over to France or something. And, you know, the, the whole thing was, I won't even go to the miserable conditions that most British soldiers had to suffer at that time. Um, and in general, the demands were accepted. In fact, the demobilization program was brought forward massively by a factor of 10. Right? They started demo increasing the demobilization rate. The British Army got a factor of 10 after this stuff. So, yeah, they had a result. Right, and just quickly on Bristol, because we're in Bristol, some things you've discovered. Um, so in Bristol, the city, uh, there were a couple of incidents we found already. On January the 7th, part of this wave of incidents, 1919, 100 men of the Bedfordshire Regiment go AWOL from their White City base. I don't know where the White City is. Bristol. Never heard of it. I haven't heard of it. Too, really. I think I might live there. By no door, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you do live there. Yeah. Yeah. Where the, yeah. where the what is it? Bowling Dawn? alley. What was it, Dawn? Um, it, it was. It was originally built just before the war as an exhibition, a great big exhibition which lost money, and then they used it for barracks and. As the war came, so sort of crap Millennium Dome sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the White City in London then as well. Yes, it? it was. Yeah. 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 So they um, there was a, and also there was actually a mutiny at the White City yeah. in London as well. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the White City in Bristol sort of down Ashton Gate, so it's your way, and it's sort of thing, and, it, and, and that that place um, was pretty awful apparently. I don't know. I mean, I've been reading a bit about the the conditions were good down there, so. They, they, these people marched out and they were basically saying, we want, you know, the Bedfordshire Regiment said, oh, we, we want out and we don't want to be doing dock work anymore. Like, you know, we've been used as kind of like low paid labourers, really. So they, that, they were there, the demands. So they marched on the council, you know, same sort of negotiating position with banners and everything. Um, and then on January 11th, yay! Great, 700 men of the men and women of the Royal Air Force and Army Service Corps of Western Aircraft Depot, yay, yeah, marched and demonstrated the demobilization. So that's two little incidents. The reason it's important is it's good to look in your own little, your own city and see what was going on, and that's what we're trying to encourage everyone to do around the country. Let's just go and look and find, it's an easy bit of work, go and find that period, you know, those couple of months, look through the newspapers, find out what was going on, look at other sources, and try and build a picture then, that everybody does it around the country, and the whole thing, which is much much easier than one historian trying to do it or three people in a university. Um, 
And finally, my favourite is that everyone goes, ah, oh, the British Busters, the Somerset Regiment, very solid, and Korean War, and all <coughs> this nonsense. But anyway, they, they knew you here as well. So January 7th, 1990, <laughs> made 700 men of the 3rd Battalion, the Gloucester Regiment, refused to, refused to parade, marched with them, and they then marched against their conditions, and their demands were accepted. So they kind of mutinied uh, on strike. Um, and on January the 8th, 9th, my favourite, men from the 3rd Battalion, the Somerset Regiment, refused to parade, they held mass meetings, they broke the barracks and then marched and demonstrated their own demobilisation. They went and smashed up the regimental fire. Maybe. So yeah, great anti-war heroes, the Somerset Regiment. So um, they're the things we found out about Bristol, so the Bristol related anyway. Um, right, quickly I want to talk about the effect, and we'll get on with something on the chat. Um, I just want to talk about the effect of these incidents on, and what was the intervention in Russia. Because one of the big outcomes is not just demobilisation, one of the outcomes of all this stuff is really the collapse, one of the main factors in the collapse of the Allied intervention in Russia. So it begins in the, the summer 1918, uh, 14 Allied nations joined in invading the new um, Soviet state, the Bolshevik state. Uh, Churchill famously said that the idea was to strangle at birth the Bolshevik state, overthrow the Soviets and restore the monarchy. So really positive. Um, and, um, <laughs> I both bring back public torture as well. Right. <coughs> I'm not into that. Um, right, anyway, so they were, they were pretty clear, the Western powers, about what they wanted to do about, about the new Soviet state or Soviet revolution. Um, and they weren't just talking about direct military intervention, which they did, they were also massive economic and military aid, uh, military economic aid for the white armies, in which there were several uh, in different places down the, down the central of Belarus, right the way down to the Ukraine. Uh, but madly, I didn't know about this, that they had, their eventual plan was to try and put a million Allied soldiers on the ground in, in Russia. A million. They had a quarter of a million there in 1918, spread amongst 14 nations. But they were only <laughs> four times that number. And some people talked about half a million British troops being in Russia fighting in 1919. So, you know, that was what Churchill and all these other idiots were wanting to do. That was their plan. That's what they wanted, they were aiming to do. Right? That's what they were after. Right? But unfortunately, in steps work, well, that's a ruined it for us. Um, but the British campaign does start in that July. They put 40,000 troops and 20 ships um, you know, into the, into the well, Mamansk and Archangel. There's less numbers of troops in Siberia and Vladivostok. Um, and to give you an idea, this is just the British. I mean, the Canadians and Australians are in Siberia, the Americans are in Siberia, Americans also in Romansk and Arkansas, you know, all around Russia, surrounding the central area where the Bolsheviks still control St. Petersburg and Moscow. So everybody's involved, and a, a large number of British troops. Um, but these strikes and mutinies of 19, January 1919 in particular do change public opinion. And you can see it in the newspapers. First of all, they talk wildly about them, then it's suppressed, and then it starts coming out again, and then they start talking about, you know, not going to the Soviet Union. And, and what, one of the famous quotes is that, you know, the frozen plain of Eastern Europe are not worth the bones of a single grenadier. This became a sort of catchphrase in the press. I think it was the Daily Express said it. But it all went round. You know, it, it suddenly became, it was almost like the Thatcher's death. You know, it suddenly became, the politics became debated. That's what happened after these mutinies of, of January 1919 and strikes. Um, and there was a general shift in public opinion. Consequently, and the problems of those mutinies, and also the mutinies that are going on in Russia amongst the British soldiers, and, the, and this, what was called the um, Slavo-British Legion, which was a kind of combined Russian-British unit or division that was also collapsing. So they had problems over there, they had problems at home, they had problems in France, and then they got public opinion turning against it, and clearly no one wants to go and fight in Russia, or at least no one wants to volunteer to do it. So in the end, the campaign is lost. Um, in less than a year after, the, after they go in April 1919, uh, in, in, in the summer of 1918, by April 1919, the whole campaign is a disaster. Uh, the British withdraw. Um, and it's mainly because of these series of the shift in public opinion, mutinies at home, mutinies in, in the field, and also they can't really reinforce because no one wants to go there. So they got a problem. They withdraw. And somebody once said it was the, the only British campaign in history, British military campaign in history, where they won every battle and lost the war. Because basically people refused to do it in the end. They didn't actually lose battles particularly. They just didn't want to fight. 
people also enjoy the Bolsheviks. Fraternising the Bolsheviks. So um, that's that's what I would argue is important in the context of meetings. We can't just see these things as just like a British experience, like oh, it's a strike and we've got to get out and go home. Well, yeah, that's true, but also it has a massive effect on foreign policy. A bit like the Vietnam War had an effect on American foreign policy after that point. Right. Uh, I've just put some questions up, some of which we've talked about amongst some other radical history groups, but this is more about questions of research outside of that. I mean, this is one particular bit I've rushed through, but there are other questions. So these are kind of questions. The first one comes from Alex, which is a good one, who supported the war in Ethiopia. These are questions we might want to be thinking about as historians or, or local historians or people who get involved in it. Who supported the war in Ethiopia? What was the position of trade unions and why? What, which socialists supported the First World War? Which people in the Labour Party supported the First World War? Why did they do that? And you know, it's seen on the left as a historic moment, the 1914. It's the point where, um, to be, where the where the women are sorted from the girls, effectively. That's what it is. It's the point where if you're a revolutionary and you believe in the overthrow of capitalism, or you're not. And it does split. You know, if you know about the history. It does split. <laughs> You know, the left movements across the world. The minority are the ones who are against the war. But their politics is very interesting and it becomes extremely relevant towards the end of the war because those people get a lot of respect because they were saying the right thing at the right time. Whereas trade union leaders, socialists, and other people don't get much respect because they were saying the wrong thing. <laughs> so that's a very important question. Also, you know, there's a whole load of work to be done on these truces and fraternizations. I talked about like you know, December 1914. Um, and all, a lot of other stuff like day-to-day -to -day refusals that were going on in the trenches. Um, yeah, effectively these refusals on all of these armies and finishing off World War One and saving millions of lives. How many millions of lives did the working class save by the war? And it could have been millions, literally, by not allowing the war to go on, by collapsing the intervention of Russia. I mean, how many million people would have died in Russia as a result of the Allied, so the Allied armies put a million troops in there? So we have to, you know, this is an idea we've got to push to the public as well. So, oh, you yeah, know, I mean, these great anti-war heroes are not a bunch of, no disrespect to anyone, conscientious objectors. It's en masse, refusal, stops the war, doesn't it? Great. Positive thing. Save lives. Um, imagine we've done that in Iraq. Anyway, right. Showed a massive support for the Russian Revolution and spread the idea of the Soviet. So the idea of where, where does this idea come and how does it spread across the world? And, processes for that, why was it exciting, was it something that was already there, it just got a new name, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff like that. Um, also, Soviet Structures in 99, obviously, the mutiny of the Black Sea 3, as I talked about in the Manskin and Archangel, how they finished off the island of integration in Russia, we talked about that. How 1990 was the year of revolution, was the closest to the to world revolution. And other social questions that are really important have come out recently, you know, everyone see that series on the servant? Yeah. What's it called? What's it called? Because we had down to Untold that history of all of us. Servants and untold history was something like that. Yeah. BBC. Yeah, it was a BBC series on yeah. servant culture yeah. in Edwardian England, wasn't yeah. it? That's true. It was, yeah. They and um, yeah, they talk about this stuff, which is like, you know, <coughs> how did the First World War change? And how did the movements of the First World War, also the experience of the First World War, change the, the relationship, you know, cultural relations between. Because it's argued that, for example, the massive role of women in wartime industry. Like, and the general nature of the conflict itself, the disruption it created, actually created a new kind of work class culture, which was like, I don't want to be a servant anymore. So that's really important because it leads on to the struggles that come after that. So, you know, how, how, did, how did, you know, when I say modernist, I mean in the sense that they were looking at Edwardian servant culture as being backward. So, all of that, there's loads more questions than that. I mean, I'm going to just grab a few, but. It, it is an opportunity, and the reason it's an opportunity is because not only is it an anniversary, so it's going to be in the media, people are going to be interested in, in, in alternative approaches as well, but also because the 100 years rule is up, and the military stuff, you know, stuff's going to start to appear in the archives, you can see people in BBC articles going, oh, <laughs> did you know that we were actually fighting somewhere that we didn't know about? You know? It's going to be that kind of stuff. Oh, there was a mutiny. So we, we, we can exploit not only the material situation and the sources, but also the political situation, I think. So uh, I'll, I'm going to shut up. So yeah, there's loads more stuff to be done. That's a selection. It really is like, really all we've done is sat down and gone, what were we interested in? What, 
you know, we can all do that. It's not a problem. Um, so there's this list by the start by Conrad's in London, which is called Remembering the Real World War One, and you can kind of join it if you want to get involved. And um, I think that's right. You just write it. Right. And you just send you send an email to, to, to that, and then it invites you to join the list. And you've got to click on it. Yeah, the number. So and we're just using that as a kind of discussion, putting stuff out, papers, references, kind of stuff at the moment. But I also would like to see some other things. I want to see recreations. I want to see, in fact, a disruption of recreations. It's already in Bristol. I've probably blown it now. I know. We're talking about playing football next December. You know, yeah. You know, yeah, and all that. But you know, what I want to see is, like, I want to see if, if they are doing some kind of recreations. I want to see, you know, 25 people dressed as British troops holding red flags going hands off Russia. Why not? It's a history, isn't it? Yeah. It's what happened. So. Let's recreate it. So we, we, we're not going to accept that, you know, obviously I recognise the difference between a remembrance parade and, and a, um, a kind of historical recreation, which somebody might decide is a good idea. And our idea is to disrupt the historical recreation with the history. And it's very important because it's part of um, democracy. But you know what I mean? So I think there's opportunities. It's not just limited to about boring talks or whatever. A bit of rereading a few books. There's lots and lots of stuff we can do. And we need to do it because it's about time this war was deconstructed properly. And it, we got there a bit in the 60s, but then it got, they've started to you know, roll it back again over the last few years. You, you start hearing these little papers, you know, you know historian writes, well, they said it was lions led by donkeys, but actually the donkeys had quite a good plan. And the plan wasn't completely stupid. And, you know, there's all this stuff going on, you know, it's like, well, you know, we're trying to re reinvent the effect or re revise the history of the First World War to say, well, the Allied generals did the right thing, you know, all those kind of So, you know, but not in the you know, not in the wider context. So there is plenty to be done, and it, and it is an exciting period, I think, if you're into history of that period. I'll be shut now, we'll just open it up for a discussion. <laughs> Similar. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm from past tense in London, so we kind of uh, do similar things to the Bristol Radical Institute, but smaller and more, more like me. Uh, <laughs> these days. Um, I mean, I just I, I sent out a thing about the same time as Roger kind of started sending out things just saying we should be kind of talking about these kind of issues and challenging the official line. Really. But I mean, I think, I think the idea of putting it out there is. is not just having that kind of saying, look, all this text exists or history exists, but actually recreation, putting it out there in the real thing. I mean, one idea of Frank came up with was to actually go to the cenotaph and like get the names of deserters who were shot and like like put a wreath for deserters who were shot and put a wreath for mutineers. Like remember people yeah. who resisted, not just kind of include them in the you know they were like in the mass, but kind of separately go there ourselves. I mean, we probably would have you know, be physically prevented to do it, but we could like take on the end with a wreath and say this is big as theirs and see what happens and um, I don't know. They were I mean, shot also, by their own side. Yeah. Well also I want to sorry, I was about, I, I want to get away from this bloody cowards and you know, mm. I, I, all this stuff about you know, three hundred people who were shot by the British Army and everything and you know, there's this debate were they like cowards or were they loot damage loot you know, damaged people with post traumatic stress disorder and like, I want to get away from that kind of stuff because that, these are controlled debates that are going on. That's a controlled debate that's been on the BBC for about ten years, right? And they got their pardon in two thousand and six. But you know, what what about all the ones you, you know, I'm I historically I've always been interested in the one who did it is boss. Like, you know, I'm not interested in the one who was like, you know, Innocent. It's always about innocence. I'm interested. I want to find the guilty. This is what this one Because the guilty he changed history, like, actually. That's the point. So we're interested in the guilty, we're interested in the shirkers, the skivers, the Bolshevik agitators. All of, you know, all these things are really interesting. It's us. It's not, you know, Johnny Bolshevik, it's it's Jimmy from Manchester. It's like, you know, Jack Jack the Shirker from like Deptford. No disrespect to all. But, um, you know, so like, you know, it's that, that kind of stuff. Rather than all this like nicey nice, there were, you know, you know, the kind of black hat and, you know, over the top stuff and then all this like, you know, all, you know, so and so was, was it, he was, he was wrongly shot. You know, what about the people who were rightly shot? You know, I'm interested in what they should have shot because they were going to cause a revolution, right? 
see what you yeah. okay. Charlie? Yeah, this, I, I went to, I lived down in Dorset, um, and I went to Bobbington Camp, which is where the... Uh, <coughs> that tank museum? Yeah, yeah, that's right, the tank museum, and it's a real long tour. And in the summer they sort of have a whole program of sort of kind of military reenactments and stuff, and of course, sure enough, my missus tried to convince me to go along and take some pictures, because I hadn't done any for a while. And uh, I went along and they were doing reenactments of the First World War. <coughs> and the Tannoy was constantly going on about, you know, it's not true that, like, you know, we were running undisciplined, the British Army was disciplined, the whole, you know, it was a very disciplined force, and here you can see them doing this, and you can see them had bloody First World War tanks kind of moving about, and they had sort of, uh, you know, trenches dug and, 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 and all the rest of it. And uh, constantly, it's funny you bring up Black Adder, because one of the things they really seem to hate is fucking Black Adder. They, kept, they mentioned it <laughs> a few times dear, dear. about it's not true, the media have been basically distorting what really happened, and, uh, you know, and this is all kind of uh, fiction, of course, and, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, I, we basically, I mean, we've basically got a film group down in Dorset, and one of the things that we've already started talking about is uh, one starting to show all the um, all the First World War films, some of which are well known, like um, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, you know, Piles of Glory and stuff like that. But there's also some other stuff that hasn't been seen, like uh, West Front 1918, which is a German film, which is a kind of you know, a bit like, uh, there's also uh, Je Cues, which is from the French yeah. side. Yeah. There's, I, I think this sort of stuff is something that can be done to sort of, I mean, especially in a small place like where we are, we can actually make show this this stuff and people do come. I mean, Roger's been down there. We get about 15 people sometimes. Um, yeah, Rock in Puffs, that was Yeah, yeah, a few Rocks in Puffs. <laughs> that, <wasn't, laughs> that was a mad landlord we got. We've, we've boycotted it now. Um, but come down to what you said. But, but the thing is, is that because it is in the area, and because Bridport was actually involved in the First World War, they've already sort of got something going on with the, uh, apparently, Bobbingdon have offered their services, and they're going to be bloody filling out, like, a high street with lethal tanks and... Oh, they're going to be doing a sort of blow uh, yeah. tattoo. So I think right. we, well, just kind of like coming into town, and there'll be the place... I mean, there's also other places like, like I don't know, does anybody know Maiden Newton, which is on the railway line between here and, uh, and, and Weymouth? Yeah. That basically during the summer has this bloody thing which is Maiden Newton at war and they're bunting up everywhere and yeah. people marching around and they drive Perfect. fucking yeah. armoured vehicles around sort of like the back streets of Dorchester and all the way. <laughs> and you're sitting in a cafe in Dorchester and these fucking yeah. tanks coming down the fucking road and you know, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyone here stop, is anyone here to stop the war here today? Yeah, I'm trying to. I think what you've told us about. Um, the end of the war and the, and the events in the army and uh, the secretary was interesting stuff. And uh, there's, there's clearly a lot of interesting work to do and um, stuff that can be uh, publicised. What interests me as well is what was happening on the home front, like, you know, who opposed the war at home, but, but both in the, in the uh, run up to the war and in years old of the war because uh, you, you, the, the notes you showed that from the book left a gap between uh, 1914 and 1918 which are the years which the, the government would be largely uh, accelerated and I think well, well, uh, whatever we do uh, needs to focus on the best locally and also needs to focus on the events at particular times in the four years, so uh, next August, etc. Yeah. At a time we need to be looking at what was happening uh, locally at, 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 at the start of the war, what, what uh, groups uh, uh, opposed the war as, as to, as to what just says, some particularly socialist organisations initially opposed it at the war and then just at the start of the war changed their minds and, uh, um, and support it was worth and why that was and the effect of that in, in the years after that. Um, 
without, without groups like the uh, the Quakers at Stormy Bristol, and I'm sure that there will be there will be uh, document annotation on on their role. I'm sure they will. Well, we've already had some, some some interest about writing a pamphlet from uh, about Western since now. I think I might be wrong. I think Guy Aldred from the, from the famous war resistor. He's sorry to do a Western suit in red. Don't ask me, but somebody from Western. Can we just finish with that? In Glasgow, everyone knows there are huge strokes through the war. Some of them may have been mythologized. Nonetheless, there were big strikes. We're interested to find out whether there were. There were. There were similar strikes in. In Bristol, Bristol, not necessarily against the war, but against the effects of the war on the yeah. uh, 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 working class. But some of the first things were rent strikes, which happened in Glasgow as well from 1915. That, there was a massive one in Glasgow in 1915, because like, there was a sort of campaigns for like to stop paying rent or reduce paying rent to landlords, and then that actually spread to a few places around the country. I know there was a big one in Birmingham, and there was some in South in London as well. But, like, like, I mean, I think that, like. I mean, it's worth, I don't know, it's almost worth, there's the, the, one of the best books I've ever read is a book called Don't Be a Soldier, which is a, very, it's a history of resistance to World War I in one very small part of London. And it's just about, it's, it's mainly around Islington and bits of Tottenham and kind of neighbouring areas. That book, I think there should be a book, that book should be written about every area, every town. As it just goes through the whole, the whole of the war and the organisation that were involved, what happened to them, the propaganda they did, the social effects, the strikes that were happening, the kind of campaigns that were involved. That book, we should be aiming to like, to produce that kind of information about everywhere. Right, just the back, mate, and then you know. Um, Chris, a lot, that awesome. But anyway, um, I just wanted to ask um, whether it might be possible to get my greedy fingers in some of your raw data um, regarding the lists of strikes and mutinies and stuff you've all already drawn. Join that list, yeah, we put it out. I think, I, think we already, I think we're already on there, but I'm, I'm quite backlogged with working the way through, through the e e emails. But, okay. now, this is not an academic environment, so uh, you know this project will like, so really share our information with everybody and you have to pay for it. So yeah, what we did was as soon as we get information, we update it, we just put it out, put it out, everybody can use it. Bad. Can I, can I just check, is, is Elaine here? Oh, you are. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay, that's good. Right. Sorry, that's good. In that case, I was thinking we could. So, uh, yeah, we haven't got that long then, but uh, yeah, if you carry on with the next question, then that might need to be the last one, right? Thanks. Um, there was a chemistry professor from Manchester University who helped the British Army with explosives towards the end of World War I. Uh, and he was, he's sometimes credited with, with helping the British victory. Uh, do you know anything about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's not. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't know. Does anyone know that? Vaguely. Oh. Vaguely. Um, it, it was just to do with. Um, uh, to produce, you need fat. So he, he, he used fat to produce another form of the um, pellets for um, shells and things. And did it have an effect? Did it, yes. Did, was it, yes. It helped tip the balance in the war. I, I don't know, but, but they were they were running out of munitions before that process. Yes. I don't know about that, but I just I just want to say a couple of things before we end, right? So it's a list, but also locally, you know, we, there were two things really coming up. But locally, we will have a, an open meeting fairly soon, like probably in the summer at some point. And that's time to discuss with other groups about what we're going to do because we've got some time. For historic history, we're, we're planning on uh, not only working on this overall project for the 1989 stuff, but other things as well, like you know, this idea of looking for research around the country. And as we've already got an, an obvious project there, which is write, your, write the radical history of your local anti war movement, you know, that's a project. Write your local history on the mutinies and strikes in 1919. You know, these things can be done as pamphlets, and Chris Rogers were aiming to do that. We would encourage everyone to help to do that research. Dawn Dyer is this woman here, would you like to put your hand up? She's an extremely useful person to talk to at the, at the Bristol Central Reference Library, along with her colleagues. 
So, you know, if anybody wants to do research at Bristol, we are really up to working with you and helping people, you know, helping them learn how to do it. We all have to learn how to do it, and Dawn has taught us loads over the years. So, you know, between us all, we can do some really useful work around this. And, and lastly, um, in October, I guess, in the Arrakis Good Friend London, there'll be some kind of national meeting we'll try and organise just to get everybody together so we can come to the right site and ideas from the country. Thanks very much for coming and putting up with us. It'll be a bit warm. <laughs>